This week, the communicators looked at the fast growth of apps for mobile phones and some of the issues raised by them. Our guests are Federal Trade Commissioner Julie Brill and California Congresswoman Mary Bono Mack. Well, recently the Federal Trade Commission issued new guidelines when it comes to apps on mobile phones. And joining us is Federal Trade Commissioner Julie Brill as our guest this week on The Communicators. Commissioner Brill, first of all, what were the guidelines that, was, that were issued by the FTC and why now? So um, the guidelines are designed to inform the app community and of course it's a very diverse community. There are lots of different players in the mobile app space designed to inform them that there are laws that apply to them uh, in the consumer protection and privacy realm and to help them figure out how to ensure that their products are in compliance with our laws. So that's the overall goal of the guidelines. Why now? The app um, economy is booming, as everybody knows. Uh, there are um, many, many consumers who are using apps on their smartphones, and in particular, kids and teens are taking up apps in droves. Um, apps have a unique ability to collect information, very detailed information about consumers. Um, geolocation, uh, they can access um, content from the phone such as uh, contact lists, uh, user ID, um, all sorts of information that uh, require careful thinking by app developers. So as this economy is booming, as there's a tremendous amount of innovation in this space, we want to ensure that the players understand that there are consumer protection laws that apply to them. Now, these are guidelines, yes. or do these have the, the effect of, of law? Oh, no, no. These are guidelines. These are designed to inform the app community, app developers, third-party service providers, third-party players, um, uh, the app stores, everyone in the space about the types of um, things they should be thinking about to ensure that they are in compliance with the law. And frankly, we think that many of the aspects of our guidelines will help them produce better products that engender consumer trust. Well, uh, Julie Brill, if an app maker, an app uh, uh, yeah, an app maker is, mm -hmm. is asking for contact lists or saying you have to have, uh, you know, if by downloading this app, you have to give us your contact list, who you've called, mm -hmm. your emails, and you agree to that. Right. What, what, what's the purpose of getting that information? What, what's that company going to do with that information? Well, that's one of the things that we're asking the app developer to think about. So you, you're raising a couple of different issues. Let me unpack that because the first point is, that um, consumers and parents who are um, downloading apps for their kids need to understand what kind of information is collected and why. And it's very important that this is um, made clear to consumers before they download the app, because once they download the app, information collection can start to happen. So one of the first and most important points that we make is um, be clear to consumers upfront, either in the app store or on the landing page, what information you're collecting and why. The, the, then the other point part of your question is to, um, we are trying to encourage app developers to really think about what information they truly need to make the app functional. So for instance, if you're playing a game, do they really need to collect geolocation information, precise geolocation information that will track the consumer if it's, if it's aggregated and collected, can aggregate the consumer as she passes through the world the entire day? And, and for all days. Um, so do the, do, does information, um, what information is really needed to make the app functional? Who else should see it? How ca in other words, should access be limited? Um, how long do you need to retain it? And when you're done with it, what are you gonna do with it? So those are the kinds of questions that basically go into um, a perspective about privacy and data collection that we call privacy by design. But you can leave aside the fancy name and just say, we want the app, develop uh, app developers to be thinking about this up front. Well, the problem is though, from some perspective, is that if you don't allow that information to be shared, you can't download the app. You might not be able to, but to the extent that this information, that's true, so short answer, you're right. The consumer will then, though, once she knows what information will be collected and for what purpose and who will see it, 
she'll ha be able to make an informed choice as to whether or not she wants to download the app. And it might be the case, as um, one very recent study by Pew um, demonstrated, that when consumers understand how much information is collected by apps, they have a tendency to not download them. So this kind of information, this truthful, transparent information about data collection practices may have an effect on app developers who will then be able to think, well, do we really, if we have to disclose all this and we're afraid consumers might not download it, let's think about whether we really do need all of this data. Are all of the FTC guidelines dealing with privacy issues? So the um, new guidelines are broken down into really two parts. One is privacy. The other aspect of the guidelines is really just about truthful advertising, to make sure that the app community understands that they are marketing a product, they are often um, uh, making promises to consumers or telling consumers that their app will do something, and they need to be able uh, to ensure that every claim that they make about their app is truthful. So just as a one example, <coughs> we recently did a case involving um, a, an app that claimed uh, if you held it up to your skin, it could treat acne through light emission, and the app developer was unable to, to substantiate that claim, and that's a problem in, ad, in truthful advertising. So we just want to make sure the app community understands that when they say their app can do something, they have to be able to substantiate that. Prior to taping this show, I went on uh, my phone and tried to download an app, and it was for a simple flashlight. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to know location. They said they would have location, contact list, et cetera, et cetera. What would be the possible purpose besides marketing of that application, knowing where I am, who I am, and who I'm calling? Well, uh, um, I think that there probably is not a purpose that is um, related to the app functionality per se. But if the app developer were sitting here at the table with us, I think the app developer would say, listen, we provide that app for free. We have to be able to monetize our effort in some fashion. So what we do is we provide data for the purpose of advertising, and we may um, help others tar advertise to you, or we may advertise to you, or some of our service providers may advertise to you. The most important point, though, is that you as the consumer understand that that's going to be happening. In other words, if all this data is going to be collected for the purpose of, of providing advertisement to you, targeted advertisement to you, that you are okay with that, and you'll download the app knowing that. Julie Brill, are you getting a lot of consumer complaints at the FTC about apps and privacy? Um, we get uh, uh, complaints and concerns about um, all sorts of activity online. Privacy is something that is certainly growing in, the, in consumers' consciousness, and we're starting to hear a lot more about it. But privacy is also one of those issues that consumers may not understand as easily as they would, for instance, that they bought a product and were unable to get a refund, right? I mean, there are some interactions that consumers have with businesses that are very obviously uh, potentially problematic, and we hear about those in the debt collection area, uh, telemarketing scams, things like that. But when it comes to privacy, consumers don't always have all the tools that they need to truly understand what's happening with their data collection. But for instance, what you experienced this morning when you tried to download the Flashlight app, you know, we do hear from consumers that they're wondering, why is all that information needed? And should I download the app? And what can happen to it? So we are starting to hear a groundswell of concerns about what's happening with data. But I don't know that it's complaints in the same way that we see complaints about other, about scam artists. Well, in a related issue, the FTC has also been investigating the information uh, marketing, correct? You've also been looking into uh, the people that sell this information and where it goes? Uh, so for instance, data brokers, yes. We um, uh, have, um, in a, a report that we issued uh, several months ago, we have highlighted some concerns around the data broker community. And data brokers are entities that collect vast amounts of information about all of us, both online and offline. Um, compile them into profiles uh, about each of us and then sell that information for various purposes to be used by various entities for um, marketing, 
uh, sometimes to make eligibility determinations for things like credit, insurance, et cetera, and sometimes for, for other purposes. We, um, I, I in particular, as one of five commissioners, but I think the agency as a whole, has expressed concern over whether consumers really understand what's happening in this industry. Um, we think that uh, data brokers, um, some of them actually provide to consumers information about what they do, but consumers have no idea who they are because they're not interacting directly with consumers. They're gathering the information and selling it to third parties and they don't really interact with the consumers. So consumers don't know who they are, how to find out what their data collection practices are, and, and how to determine what information the data broker has about them and whether or not it needs to be corrected. So there are lots of transparency issues that we think uh, need to be addressed in this uh, data broker industry. Commissioner Brill, if a, an app maker disregards the guidelines, is there a stick at the end of that? Um, there, if, if an app maker disregards the guideline, there's no, uh, we're, we're not going to bring an enforcement action against them simply for disregarding the guidelines. The guidelines are best practices. Um, if they're followed, an app developer or app maker will really be on the road towards um, uh, not only complying with the law, but we think also, as I said, engendering consumer trust, which will help them with their marketing and with the growth of their, of their product. If some of the um, elements of the guideline, though, are not followed, an app developer could find themselves under our scrutiny because they might cross the line into an area that does violate the law. And so it's not just, look, if they don't follow, follow the guidelines, okay, it's not that we'll bring an action against them right away, but not following the guidelines means that they could run into trouble down the road. Do you think that the laws regarding privacy are succinct enough or clear enough or modern enough, or would you like to see other action by Congress? I um, believe, and um, other of my um, colleagues believe, that uh, Congress should enact a privacy law um, here in this country. I think that we have good protections, but we could have better protections in this country, and especially as technology has been advancing so rapidly. It's time to be clear about what the rules of the road are. We do the best we can. We issue guidelines, we do education, we do, I, I go around to businesses all the time and speak, we do law enforcement, we issue reports, but at the end of the day, I think a law would provide clearer rules of the road for everybody, which I think would benefit business as well as consumers. I also think that there are some particular laws that Congress could act in addition to a general privacy law. So for instance, with respect to data brokers and the transparency around data broker practices that we discussed a few minutes ago. How does the FTC work with the FCC, the NTIA, Congress, et cetera, when it comes to privacy? Who takes the lead? Um, we follow what, <coughs> we, we, we do what Congress tells us to do. Um, Congress has given us a very expansive law dealing with privacy. It's um, an unfair and deceptive acts and practices law is the general um, law that we enforce. We also have laws in particular areas that we enforce involving children's privacy, financial privacy, some medical information. And when I said financial, it's in some contexts, some medical information in some contexts. So um, we uh, are very much involved in privacy and in many ways are that we at the Federal Trade Commission are the nation's uh, leading privacy uh, law enforcement entity. The FCC has a very important role when it comes to the carriers and when it comes to other entities in the mobile space. So we work with our sister agency on, on these issues. And uh, would it be possible to have a, a, a dual system where, okay, if you want this app you can pay a buck a month for it and we won't track you or you can get it for free and we get your information. Is that in our current world? I think it exists in our current world. I mean, I, you know, Amazon's Kindle uh, to begin with. Um, there are lots of other um, entities that say uh, we will target you with advertising. Um, 
or uh, you know for one price, maybe free um, or a lower price. But if you don't want to be advertised to, um, here's what the uh, product will cost you. I think we may move into an app world that is more uh, along that line, along those lines, that does develop into that kind of a business model. As long as the disclosure is clear to consumers, as long as it's upfront, um, and as long as the type of data collection that we're talking about isn't so invasive that it really requires extra affirmative consent by the consumer. Um, as long as what we're talking about is sort of the normal tracking for the purpose of targeted advertising, for instance, that might be something that um, will we'll be seen relatively soon. And if you would like to read the guidelines, you can go to ftc.gov. They are published online at the Federal Trade Commission's website. Julie Brill, one of the Democratic commissioners on the Federal Trade Commission, has been our guest for this first half of The Communicators. Coming up next, Representative Mary Bono Mack, who is also looking at this issue. And now joining us as we continue our conversation about apps is Representative Mary Bono Mack, who is the chairman of the Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade Subcommittee for the Energy and Commerce Committee. And Representative Bono Mack, you just held a hearing recently on apps. What was the point of your hearing? Well, the point was to make sure that we explore what's going well in this in this area. You know, there are so many jobs that are being created there. We want to make sure any policies that we put forward in Washington don't squash a blooming industry, a blooming, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, nobody had thought of this. It's a relatively new industry that has been unleashed because of great ideas. And we certainly don't want the government to come in and, and destroy that. And what were some of the problems that you saw in this area that you'd like to address? You know, one of the biggest problems is, is the workforce, that they're still looking for more and more people to move into this industry, to develop apps, to work on creating apps, to all that goes into it. Uh, basically, that's the biggest problem. I think the fears people have, of course, are that somehow we're going to, in Washington, decide that we're going to come in and tell everybody how to do their business or how not to do their business and hurt a growing business. But the only real fear was, you know, workforce issues. The rest of it is nothing but optimism. They're recognizing there's so much growth in this industry that people are more and more turning to apps. You know, I use the example uh, in the hearing sort of as a lighter moment that the other night I was babysitting my grandson and uh, he started crying and I did the, any, the, you know, the good thing that any grandparent would do is I went right to my app, my iPad and tried to find the app that would soothe the baby. Um, so Were you successful? Well, no, I, I guess I downloaded an, an app, but it, it was too late by then, and, and my grandbaby was not going to have any of it. But the point is, is that, you know, more and more we're becoming habituated that if there's a problem, there's an app on the market that we should go look for and see how good it is. And uh, that was what was very exciting about the hearing, is, is that people are very optimistic about the growth in this industry. Well, the name of your hearing was if there's where there's economy or something like this, where there are jobs. Where the jobs are. There's, there's an app for that. Right. So how many people, do you know how many people or what this contributes to our economy at this point? Well, I know that the projected growth is that it's going to be a $100 billion a year business by 2015, projected again. But, you know, that's a, I don't know if that's a target good number or, or whether it's going to be higher than that. Because, again, people are more and more and more adapting to the fact that there's an app for anything. Uh, you know, what is most amazing is truly if you think think of something and you go look for an app for it, somebody's probably a few steps ahead of you already and it's already on the market. Uh, but more and more people are going to turn to this. Uh, and, and I think a lot more software developers are going to recognize that the mobile app platform is the logical place for people to go. And in your opening statement, you said that over four, nearly 400 million apps were downloaded last Christmas Eve and Christmas on that day alone worldwide. Um, so many of the apps are free. How are the app makers making money? Well, you know, I think that's a good question to ask them. I think that there are various business models out there. Some probably aren't making money. Some are perhaps losing money. Uh, you know, I think one of the big questions that Congress is going to ask is, you know, is, is our privacy and our data how you're monetizing your app? And I, you know, that it, uh, is, uh, Representative Markey brought up a bill that he has now looking at privacy in the mobile app space. But that is one of the questions that, you know, you do have to ask if nothing's really free, what are we giving up for a free app? Uh, but many are making a lot of money. If you look at the huge success of something like Zynga, 
Um, anybody who plays Words with Friends knows, for example, that Zynga is a hugely successful company. Uh, but I think there's various uh, business models that they've all used to become successful. Um, Representative Mary Bono Mack, uh, we talked with Julie Brill earlier and uh, from the FTC, and she talked about their new guidelines. And so many of them deal with privacy. Have you reviewed those guidelines, and what are your views on those? Well, I, I think the real discussion between the FTC and the Congress is, is how much of it should be voluntary or industry-based, how much should they self-regulate, or how much should the Congress step in. I think that there's always a pressure that the Congress can put on the voluntary guidelines that industry uses. Uh, so, and I think the FTC is constantly evolving too with their viewpoint on privacy. I think over the past year or two, we've done a very good job of sort of slowing the need to regulate in the space, because I think we've proven the case that we can stifle innovation if we come in too heavy handed. So I appreciate that the FTC has taken a, a, a sort of this approach that let them self-regulate, let's give them guidelines to follow. But you know, industry themselves will tell you, tell us, that they also know that it is in their best interest to provide something for the consumer that also doesn't go too far. So the real issue is, is how much of it is guidelines, how much of it is self-industry regulated, or how much of it is heavy government intervention. When it comes to the privacy issues, what's your philosophy? Well, my privacy issues is, is uh, to move slowly. Uh, there are a lot of things, and I know we've talked about this before, there are a lot of things that kind of, you know, I called it last time I was here, the yuck factor of, of it's something that's gone too far. Uh, but to this day, you know, it's still, you know, the American consumer is recognizing oftentimes they're, they're giving up their privacy for convenience. Uh, the consumer is choosing, again, you know, in, in many of these cases, and a lot of these apps specifically, right off the bat will say, in order to proceed further, you need to you know, enable your tracking device. Are you OK with that? And the American consumer will say, yes, because I want this app so badly, it's going to make my life better. I think the Congress, if we step in and stifle innovation um, before really any harm is done to the American public, I think you know, my fear is we can hurt uh, a struggling economy further if we're not careful. Last week on this program, we talked with your fellow uh, Energy and Commerce Committee member, Joe Barton. And we talked about the need or potential need for a more comprehensive telecom rewrite or, or privacy bill. What are your viewpoints on that? Well, you know, Joe Barton's a great member of the committee, and certainly uh, his former term, you know, his ter term as chairman was uh, taught him an awful lot. But I think in, in this space, Joe tends to be a lot more heavy regulatory than, than I believe is, is, is wise. And, you know, certainly as a California member, I care about California companies, and so much of this innovation is driven out of California. Perhaps I hear more from these companies and the startups who are saying, don't regulate in this space. Uh, I think, you know, Joe Barton tends to uh, believe that some things are perhaps technologically feasible when I'm not sure that they are. So these are questions and, and good reasons for committee hearings and, and discussion amongst ourselves as members. If, how would you grade the health of the tech industry today, being, oh. being from California? Oh, I would grade it uh, as extremely strong and growing. Again, if we can meet the, the demand of the, the people who are looking for these apps developers. Uh, yesterday I asked a very important question. Are we headed towards a bubble, sort of another tech bubble? Are we risking that there's just, this is just too good to be true? And that there's pretty good unanimity that, no, this is entirely different, that this is a strong, strong, robust uh, economy that is developing, uh, and that people are you know, optimistic that it is a solid economy. And I believe that to be true. Last time we talked with you, you were holding hearings about the Sony, uh, uh, the PlayStation. Um, the data breach. The data right. breach, the data breach. What's the status of that? It's a, it's a work in progress. I unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, it should be moving, in my view, quicker than it is. Every week there's a new breach. And uh, that in my view, there's more reason to bring the consumer on board, to have the consumer be a part of the process of stopping these data breaches. But in the Congress, there's still um, some give and take. Uh, I've had to sort of you know, weave through a little bit of the, the uh, personalities within Congress to find the right bill, and I think we have that right bill. But for a lot of members still, uh, they question the need for one federal 
regime or one federal law as opposed to all of the different states having their individual patchwork laws. This is probably one of those examples that, that it, something's going to have to happen, that people are, pro you know, we're proven why we're trying to pass this bill bef before some lawmakers get it. Do you see cybersecurity coming back in the next Congress or potentially in the uh, lame duck session? Well, I think the issue of cybersecurity is here to stay. I think it's the, the future of, of uh, national security and our, and our um, protections. The issue specifically on the table right now, I think, is going to be around a little bit longer yet. I don't know whether it will be a lame duck session. I think in the Senate there certainly is a lot of debate and discussion on how we move forward. In my view, I, you know, I support um, Senator McCain's uh, his philosophy that the best way to do this is not to strap private industry to the government for the government to decide uh, and, and to mandate what technologies are. Because one thing is for sure, the government, especially the Congress, tends to be much slower uh, in this space than the private industry. And if government is already finally passing what is antiquated and sending that out into the private market, I mean, it's useless. It, it actually can, can be a, a, a problem rather than a solution. Representative Mary Bono Mack is chair of the Commerce, Manufacturing and Trade Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Republican from California. When it comes to children, is that a different, do you view privacy legislation, any type of tech legislation differently or not? Well, we all do, of course. Uh, there, we all agree that the children need, our children need to be protected differently. The problem is, um, for example, with Facebook, let's take Facebook as an example. Uh, when we talk about trying to regulate differently for children, uh, we have to recognize that children are often given tools to participate as older children or as adults by their parents. So we're trying to prevent a problem that is already being you know, circumvented by parents and parental controls that parents are saying, I think this Facebook tool is so useful for my children, I'm going to help them get on board. And we're trying to already establish this, you know, members of Congress, some are saying we need to change the, the age when parents have already said they reject that. So I think there's a, the problem here again is to ask what are we stopping? I know there's a brand new um, tool coming out, I guess the Toys R Us has a brand new tablet uh, designed for children. Uh, and this is an example of, you know, we should look at it. Is, are there harms that are potential to children, or is this actually a, a wonderful tool for kids? And if Congress gets in and becomes too heavy-handed, are we pre preventing useful new devices like this tablet from coming to the market? Recently, there's been some articles in the paper about the data sellers, the data brokers, and uh, taking this information from apps or whatever, and then selling it. Do you think do you agree with looking into where that information is going? I, I have a perhaps a little bit different philosophy. I think that every piece of data that we put out on the internet is being collected many places anyway. Uh, and I think the consumer should always be very careful about what they're willing to put up there and to put out there. Uh, data brokers who sort of build the, the databases and combine all of the data and put it together uh, you, one does have to ask, you know, is there a healthy purpose for that or not? But again, to me, the consumer needs to recognize if you're putting it out there, somebody is collecting it, period, the end, whether it's a data broker or whether it's an individual app. Uh, and if, you know, the consumer cares, they should educate themselves about what might happen to their data and be careful about what they put out there. If Republicans retain control in the next Congress and you remain chair of your subcommittee, where what type of issues would you like to look at in the next time? Well, again, job creation in the space that we're talking now. You know, apps, I think, are a very exciting place to go, as I've said. It's, it's almost as if somebody invented the microwave oven in the app space, and, but there are a million offshoots of, of a microwave oven that are even better and that everybody's using them. Uh, so I think we will logically stay in how do we, how do we continue to empower businesses to flourish and do well. How do we prevent the government from regulating and stifling job creation? We'll continue to do that. Privacy is a logical space. Data security, of course, will continue on. So we'll, we'll stay there. You know, the other thrust we haven't talked about, but under my subcommittee's jurisdiction is manufacturing. And uh, we'll definitely continue to look at manufacturing and bringing more manufacturing jobs back. Uh, Mary Bonomack, chair.
Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade Subcommittee. This is the Communicators on C-SPAN.